to me, that's the biggest thing about being a musician is having an identifiable personal sound. Yeah. As a yeah. band or on your instrument. Hello and welcome to Where the Living Room Used to Be, a podcast about Rhode Island's music scene. Hey everyone, it's James. On this special edition episode, I catch up with the esteemed bass player Joe Potenza to talk about Evening Sky's new album, One Mic, Two Weekends. This is a really interesting album, as it was literally recorded using a single mic. Uh, And as you'll hear us talk about, it kind of taps into both one of the earliest ways of recording, you know, all the way to some of the most modern technology uh, that utilizes a high-definition audio format. Uh, So we'll take a deep dive into the recording process of this new record, as well as talk about the start of the band and many of the other things that they're up to. As a quick side note, I do promise to have Joe back for a full episode to talk in much more detail about his long and storied career in music, uh, so no worries there. Um, but yeah, you know, thanks as always for checking this out. Uh, you know, if you like the episode, you know, please subscribe wherever you're listening, and uh, make sure to pick up Evening Skies' album One Mic Two Weekends when it comes out this month. Enjoy. Joe Potenza, thanks so much for hopping on and uh, taking some time to talk to me. Uh, it's, it's an honor to have you. Oh man, I have, it's a great opportunity, and thanks thanks so much for having me, especially considering the uh, the roster of guests that's been on uh, <laughs> before me. That's uh, that's something. Ah, well, thank you. Um, to kind of you know kick things off, can you uh, you know I guess just kind of introduce yourself uh, to those that, that may not know who you are, and then. Uh, and sure. talk a little bit about uh, the band Evening Sky and how that came about. Okay. All right. Well, I'm a bass player. I'm a bass guitarist. I've uh, been in the area. Lifelong Rhode Islander. Um, uh, kind of one of the old guys now um, uh, <laughs> around. Been, you know, just uh, played a bazillion gigs and, um, you know, kind of varied background. Grew up, you know, started off like, like everybody started off, you know, jumping into a garage band because we saw the Beatles, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, um uh, you know, although, although I was fairly young when I saw the Beatles, uh, but not not uh, not young enough to, to 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 lose to miss the point that the girls were going crazy and these guys just look looked cool as hell. And yeah. um, if this was something I wanted to do. So basically, my whole family, you know, got into it. Both my brothers, are musicians, great guitar players. Um, so I've, uh, I've I've been around the area for a bunch, uh, you know, freelancing. Uh, doing different kinds of musics. Uh, a lot of people associate me with jazz, although it's not necessarily, you know, all, all I do. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, and, and in, certainly in the beginning, I wasn't a jazz player at all. I was, I was a, I wanted to be Barry Oakley for a long time. <laughs> oh, okay, know? yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Evening Sky. Just to jump, jump right to that. That uh, there's, it's a quartet. Uh, it's not my band. It's I, I'm one of a. a number of cooperative members of the band so yeah. it's a quartet uh the guitar player is gino rosati mm-hmm. uh the pedal steel player is chris brooks uh the drummer is eric hastings and i'm playing bass um nice. gino and i have played gino's an ex-navy guy who retired and in, in out of newport and living in rhode island lives in cranston now for for about, about 10, 15 years. Cool. Uh, he and I started playing jazz gigs together and I love guitar players. I grew up in a family of guitar players. So, um, <laughs> uh, we hit it off and, um, he's just a, he's one of my favorite guitar players that I've ever played with. And, um, yeah. so we did a, just a ton of gigs together over the, over the years. And, um, Eric Hastings, who, who, uh, people know from drumming with, uh, Becky Chase's band mm-hmm. and also has performed with a lot of bands around here. Um, I, I had known Eric from from having him sub on drums on a few gigs that I did. Uh, Chris Brooks, the steel player, 
a, a few of us knew him because he would show up at, at some of the blues jams or jazz jams and that kind of stuff. And he'd come in with his pedal steel guitar and everyone would be, mm, <laughs> what's this going to be? Yeah. And yeah. then someone would call a Thelonious Monk song and he'd tear through that or he'd play through a standard or, you know, and it's like, well, this guy swings and, he, you know, and, and he's, you know, he's a hell of a musician. He's a great guitar player as well. Um, yeah. So we all kind of knew each other. I got a I got a very excited email from Gino Rosati. Mm -hmm. And people who know him, I've said this before, he's not a really excitable kind of a guy. But oh, no. No. the email was just gushing. Hey, I did a session with this steel player. Uh, we played it. We, we we got together and played. We got to get together and do something. This is got, this is this is going to sound great. Today. Oh, okay, so <laughs> sure. I yeah. knew everybody involved. You know, so I'm thinking who he said we got to get a drummer. So I was trying to think of who would be versatile enough to play with those, the, have all those influences, mm -hmm. and also tasteful enough. And you know, and Eric Hastings came to mind. And so we got yeah. together at Eric's studio. Didn't really know what we were going to play, but we said, "But you know, uh, it, we'll have fun." Yeah. Um, and we played a few tunes. We played a couple of jazz tunes. We played uh, a Pat Metheny tune. We played a couple of country standards. We played, uh, you know, so, some straight ahead things. And the sound, everybody really early on got an idea of what it would sound like. Okay. Of, yeah. of the possibility of of guitar and pedal steel and doing kinds of music that included roots and country leanings. Yeah. But also, you know, we're informed with a jazz sensibility, you know, but we weren't play, trying to play like, you know, bebop with, with country changes or anything like that. It, it's, it was the idea of let's see how we can put these things together. And the more we tried out covering different tunes, then we tried covering, like I said, Pat Metheny's tunes, mm -hmm. which, you know, have this kind of pastoral, you know, uh, vibe to them but with you know they're really well written and the and the the, har the harmony in is, is 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 really strong and and very interesting to play um playing tunes that just had grooves to them or play, play uh, or um playing some a couple of straight ahead country tunes i i yeah. suggested at one point let's let's play the tennessee waltz okay yeah just yeah. because it's <laughs> it's a simple old lovable standard and we played it and there was such a vibe to the way we'd played that tune. Mm -hmm. It, you know, it, it harked back to, um, you know, when country music was first popular in the late fifties, you know, not just first then, but you know, what I remember about popular music in, uh, that, that, that came from country music, mm -hmm. you know, Patsy Cline and, uh, and, um, Hank Williams and people like that. And, and you know, course, Webb yeah, Pierce yeah. and, and, uh, you know, and it swung and it had soul, and, uh, you know, and the thing is, no one felt like they had to overplay or kill it. There was lots of space left, yeah. you know, and and um, Gino had one or two tunes that he had written, a couple of which I had played. And he said, hey, let's try this one. Mm -hmm. And it's actually one of the tunes, the lead off tune on the uh, on the album called The Good Fight, which is kind yeah, of like okay. a gospel -y kind of tune. And um, we tried playing that tune with the, with that quartet, and it just sounded great. So yeah. we realized we had something, and uh, then we just kept rehearsing. Thankfully, Eric had a studio we could rehearse in. Um, we rehearsed a bunch of stuff and um, came up with different idea ideas for covers, some out of the way, you know, rock tune covers, uh, you know, jazz tunes done with different grooves, um, that kind of stuff. A couple of other country standards that just you know played with no irony at all, just like, you know, a street country shuffle. Yeah. Um, and then a couple that we'd mess around with, Eric suggested playing Willie Nelson's On the Road Again. Okay. But we didn't use the the standard groove that he uses. He, we kind of adapted the groove from uh, uh, Paul Simon's tune late in the evening. So oh, it had wow. more like, almost like a Calypso kind of kind of lope to it, you know. Wow, um, okay. But it worked. It, yeah. You know, it, it worked. We weren't trying to be, you know, comedic about it. Uh, you know, we were trying to have, you know, have respect for all the, all the different genres, but mm -hmm. let's just see what we can put together because no one was stopping us. And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, when it came time to record, uh, we, we tried to, we, we, we had, came up with the idea of uh, bringing in guest singers. Some people would come in and sing with us on, on some of the gigs that we did. And, okay. um, we decided to record a, an album of covers. So yeah. we, we put together, you know, things by, uh, Jimi Hendrix and, and the police and, uh, 
a couple of other things and had and uh, the Beatles and had pe- different friends of ours singing on the tunes. Yeah, that was the first release. It was called was, Guest Stars. Yeah, that came out la- early last year, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It yeah, took yeah. a little while, but uh, you know, again, all the recording was done at, at Eric's place, and um, okay. Uh, so we we got get that out just to get something out there. Gino is kind of the, the writing dynamo of the band. He's written by far most of the pieces that we, the original stuff that we do. Yeah. And um, he just keeps coming up with, the more the band developed its sound, the more he started to write for the sound of the band. I got you. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and that's when things really started to get interesting. Now it was like, all right, we, we, we kind of, went around the cycle. We, you know, found our sound, applied it to some covers, developed it even more, played some originals. And now Gino and, and, and the rest of us who write and they are thinking this, this might sound good for the band to do this. And oh, people okay. were even suggesting to, Hey, why don't you guys cover this song or, or that kind of thing? So yeah. the band developed its sound early on, which I'm really happy about because to me, that's the biggest thing about being a musician is having an identifiable personal sound. Yeah. As a yeah. band or on your instrument, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, that was starting to happen. Gino just keeps writing and writing and writing. He'll come in with four or five tunes and, you know, oh, like try this kind of like session. Like he, uh, yeah. How does, it, how does it, he present them? Is he presenting them as like, sometimes they're just like, here's a riff and let you kind of play off of it. It kind of, it, it, it varies. Together. Sometimes he'll come in and he has an exact idea of how, how, you know, what he wants to do, even like down to the baseline. Yeah. Um, there's a tune on the on on the upcoming album uh, called Slip and Slide, okay. which is yeah, it, it's a it's a funk. It's a very simple funk tune. It comes out of like the meter, really early meters, instrumentals, that kind yeah. of stuff. When I first started playing it, I was playing way too much bass. <laughs> I was I was you know trying out all these you know all these lines and oh yeah the harmony goes I could play this and this would work in here and he kind of like whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, right. you got to play less you got to play less and then we try it again is like yep, you, you got to leave more space for the for the melody here or there so i pared down the line a little bit more so he had a real a solid idea of what that tune should sound mm-hmm. like there's others he brought in that are just sketches on paper oh really uh, okay. you know like a, a, a melody line with and here's a a, a, cha- a, a, a a song form written there's the chords i don't have a melody for this part but I have no idea how this should go. And he, and he, and there's a couple of times he'll point to Eric and myself, the rhythm section. He says, you guys have to do something with this. <laughs> you guys, you guys are going to yeah. make something out of this. Yeah. And, uh, and then we try stuff out and yeah. um, you know, now we know we're, we're getting a better idea of what works for it with, for the band sound and what really isn't, you know, right for the band sound. So the first time he did this, I was, you know, I had no idea what, you know, what to do of it and whether we, or whether we like it or not. Now we're getting a, a real idea of how, you know, he, he, yeah. Where you should go. Either what it. he hears or he, yeah. he trusts us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, both of you are quite a uh, great player. So I would trust you as well if I just kind of threw something out there. So, I well, there's sometimes he doesn't trust me. <laughs> oh no. There are sometimes he doesn't trust me. I've had, I, I've had some musical ideas. Yeah. I, I made a suggestion uh, last week at, a, as a matter of fact, a rehearsal for, um, an ending for one of his tunes and he just yeah. immediately shot it right down. He said, no, 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 no. We're not gonna... <laughs> <laughs> nope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he, you know, he knows. And, and he was, he was right. So I, I, a couple of yeah. days later, I called him up and I said, all right, how about this one? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I ran, I ran another idea by him and he said, yeah, that might work. You know? So, you know, 
we try to we try to like you know pay attention to what everybody brings to the band and not try to we don't try to make it something it's not on the other hand we've we've stretched some things i mean uh we we were rehearsing them running through some tunes by Thelonious Monk and uh one of them I thought let's see how it, this would sound if we played it as a surf tune oh really and it actually and it actually sounded really good yeah <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like something Bill Frizzell would do you know oh, okay. who was a big influence on us I, I know Gino said it I we've all said it Bill Frizzell and his approach is a, is a huge influence on what we do yeah but yeah just kind of quickly so when you were Recording guest stars, you did that at Eric's studio, which is the Grapevine, correct? The Grapevine, yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, how was that done? Was that more of a traditional uh, recording session where everything was uh, mic'd as it was and done over, yep. you know, like through overdubs and bringing people in in different sessions and stuff? Like yeah, that? we did it. Yeah. Uh, we did the, all the basic tracks, multi, you know, multi-tracked. Yeah. yeah um, but we're playing all, all playing live. Um, but um, we might overdub a, another guitar part, or um, in a lot of cases, we'll we need uh, multi tracks so that I can fix mistakes in the bass parts. No, which is no, no way. Oh yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm the I'm the punch in king. I'm the pu- which which led to some major anxiety when we were recording with the one mic album. I'll talk yeah. about that later. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I I I've, I haven't done a whole lot of recording, but I've done enough to to get to the point where I know. If we're going multi-track and they're taking the bass with a direct line, so I'm not bleeding into anybody's mic, yeah. I can play the part and relax. And if I get through it and and make miss one chord or make a slight delay or you know or there's yeah. some finger noise or whatever, I know I can go back and punch in. And especially with digital technology, yeah, you know you can just isolate that thing and 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 punch it in. Or sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes the person you know at the board can fix it. Like, yeah, you know, that note was a little bit. out of tune. All right. Yeah. Let's, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, that I derive great comfort from that. Yeah. Um. But, so we did the, the the guest stars album like that. Sometimes the singer, most often the singers weren't there because it's a very small space. So we we would get yeah. bleed. So we record the basic instrumental tracks. The singers would come in, and and then put their things on. Um. Same thing. We had uh, our friend Ralph Rose and a chromatic harmonica player come in and play on uh, our cover of Blackbird the oh, Beatles yeah. tune yeah. and uh, he came in after the whole thing was done I guess. and, and yeah. just laid his part in. So that was multi-tracked with overdubs. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've done things where those singers have sung, sung live with us and yeah, that's been fun. That's cool. And gigs. when did the band start? How long have you guys been playing? Together? Oh man. I, I think it's like three years now. Okay. I think I kind of lost track, but I'd, uh, you know, I, I think it's like what is time now, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially the last year it's become a, yeah. it became, it's become a real yeah. blur, uh, with, and, and, but I'll tell you the re- being able to, with appropriate pauses when someone suspected that they might have exposure, uh, or someone close to them had been exposed, we'd have to pause the rehearsals for a bit, but, um, yeah. being able to do that on a regular basis in a safe way that we were all you know secure with um and still continue to play uh that's that really i know it, for my own self it saved my sanity yeah uh, because you can only practice bass by yourself so much before yeah. you know <laughs> you don't even want to hear it anymore yeah, yeah. yeah. um and yeah, i need to be playing off other people i need i need yeah. to be playing in the room with other people you know mm-hmm. uh audience audience is great recording is great but just the interaction is is what i need yeah so, so thankfully we were able to do that over the last year. And um, that's kind of where the one mic thing came in. Um, Eric, who it's his studio. He, he runs the board. He runs the, you know, runs the digital, you know, recording. Eric has worked with um, two brothers, uh, George and Jeff um, Hazelrig, yeah. who I think are in Philadelphia. And they have uh, a firm that, uh, that builds high end audio gear. Uh, so they, he has a couple of their very high end, high sampling digital preamps that okay. he, he, he records with. And Eric also has like some good microphones in his studio. He kept talking to us about, Hey, I've got this really good rib stereo ribbon mic. Yeah. And, and we all said, Oh, great. But you know, we didn't, you know, yeah. Like that and, cool. uh, <laughs> and he, yeah, yeah, very good for you. And, <laughs> And he said, I want to try recording us 
just with this one mic. And we all went, okay. oh, man, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, okay, fine. So he sets it up, and we spent, we devoted a whole day to just doing pre-production trial recordings with the stereo mic. We'd yeah. place it in one area of the room. We'd move it. We'd turn the amps this way and that way. We'd face the bass amp this way. We'd move it closer to the drums, further away mm -hmm. from the drums. And finally, after doing this and then doing trial recordings and listening hard, it was a real painstaking process, but we came up with a, you know, the location and yeah. the way to position the amps so that we captured everybody. And then it was a matter of everybody individually adjusting their volumes while they're playing. So if Gino played a solo and he had his volume up a certain level, when it's time for Chris's solo, or if there was a bass solo, everybody had to physically bring their volume down. Wow. Okay. Because you have to mix live while you're doing the recording with this one. It's, yeah. it's a digital version of old school recording. That's how they did it in the old days. One mic, and everybody spaced themselves either closer to yeah. or um, or farther away. You, you can see this. I, I was watching uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom recently. Okay. And the re the recording studio um, scenes, they're recording yeah. to one mic. And some people are closer to the mic. Some people are you know farther away. Uh, when somebody sings, they lean into the mic and then they step yeah. back. For the, you know, yeah. so it's that Kinda process. That, like bluegrass band that's the, that's the way everybody yeah. recorded in those days yeah, one yeah. mic you know yeah um and they're there you have to be really careful to do it you have to know the material you have to have be able to have a good sound your own self on your instrument mm -hmm. you're not going to be relying in sweetening it up in the mix and you can't make mistakes <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> because you can't do them which immediately now that's where my terror becomes heightened because <laughs> i rely so much on the punching yeah i at least every every track that i've ever recorded that winds up being good there's been at least two punches in there maybe yeah. more that was a good take but we need to fix this note here and you missed the cue over here good i'll fix them boom and we're yeah up. yeah yeah with the one mic thing you can't do that what what you play is what's on the take you can't overdub instruments later on you can't Reduce the volume if you know the the steel was too loud during the chorus, yeah. or if the bass was too loud over here. Yeah, you know, you have to physically get it right. I mean, we would put tape on the floor and take pictures of the studio, so it's perfect for where the mic should be located. Yeah, so that we could recreate it when we come back the next weekend. So the no fix policy scared the living shit out of me, <laughs> and yeah. um. I yes, can, and because you, yeah. wow. you'd rehearse the tune, and you don't want to rehearse it so much that you beat the improvisational life mm -hmm. out of it. Yeah. So you want to get a fresh take, and you don't want it to sound like someone playing through clenched teeth yeah. or second guessing everything they do. You don't want that sound on there. You want relaxed and grooving, and you know, and mm -hmm. interaction. And if you have an idea, you want it to be spontaneous as well, because you know there's jazz elements to this. Yeah. So. It's just scary as shit. And, um, you know, for somebody like me, so we would do the, we'd do the tunes and we'd get a good take on one. All right, let's move on to the next. I'm feeling really good. Great. And then we get all the way through this one. And in the very last chorus, I blow the out chorus. Or I miss, I go to the wrong section of the song. Or, you know, now other people made mistakes too. As, as we say in the liner notes on, on the album, everybody had the opportunity to be that guy. Yeah. Yeah. So there were there were you know maybe one or two one or two sessions where it was like okay I think we're, I think we're done for now yeah yeah and then on the drive home I'm just like beating myself up like crazy like you know I can't play you know, oh god <laughs> yeah. but then we'd come back and we'd listen to some of the playback and except for the you know the clam here and there it's like all right that sounds really good this is worth working on yeah and then that would kind of revitalize us and we'd go back in and and nail a good take. Yeah. So generally how many takes was it to, to It really that? varied from tune to tune. Some of the tunes were easier than others. Um oh, okay. like Hope Street Shuffle. Hope Street Shuffle went down pretty easily. Okay. That that was probably like two two takes maybe. Um something like um uh I think Time for You maybe was a second take or third take. Um yeah. other things like um I'm trying to think of one that took took a lot. 
Um, the good fight we had been playing a lot. So that I think was like a first or second take. Wow. Um, but others like the, the ballad for the ones we lost. Yep. That just that to, to, to keep the vibe uh -huh. and to not play any wrong notes or to keep the form that, that was frustrating us a lot. I, I remember, <laughs> okay. um, this other oh, snake oil was really easy. Snake oil was just at that point. I remember we, you know, it was the end of a Saturday, Saturday morning session. And, you know, we had all had the coffee and muffins at that point. <laughs> and we, you know, it was just like, let's go for it. Yeah. On the other hand, I, I remember like, um, slip and slide, forget yeah. it. That was like, that took, we had to come back to that a, a second day. Oh, wow. Okay. We tried a bunch of them and it just like, it wasn't happening. The groove wasn't right. Or somebody would, you know, uh, do something, you know, mess up or, you know, and like, like Eric said, everybody had the chance to be that guy. <laughs> and that one, I remember we just get, you know, all right, let's put it aside. We'll come back to it. Yeah. And then we came back to, um, thing and I probably, probably another two or three takes. And we, you know, at that point we were getting pissed off. So we just said, <laughs> like, all right, yeah, all right, let's not gonna come on. <laughs> and we just like tore through it. And, uh, and that's when it had the energy and when you were more relaxed, mm -hmm. when you just stopped thinking about it, you know, that was the thing is thinking about it would, would kill you every time it, it does when you're playing live too. You don't want to be thinking No, no, uh, it's yeah, like, it's you know, what comes next? No, you know, it, it, you can't be doing that. And that one was, I remember that was a tough one because we wanted to have it sound you know, funky and not tentative. Yeah. But you also didn't want to overdo it, you know, or play too much bass, you know, that kind of stuff. It had to, you know, have the space in it. So that, that, I remember that one being a tough one. Gino and I were at that point, um, we would ride to and from the sessions together. He would drop me off at home. Yeah. And there were a couple of times going home, especially after that one, I remember where <laughs> we just took turns beating ourselves up. <laughs> you know like uh, he's driving and he's going like i suck i can't play guitar i'm saying you suck i sucked worse i fucked it up even more than you did and it, no no i was like i i i can't even play you know then i said i i forgot stuff i've been playing and like you know for, for months and i and i i don't know how i messed it up and we just took turns not each other but just beating ourselves up yeah. two catholic boys you know <laughs> two catholic boys just like having at it with self you know Oh God, it was uh so when we you know, when we finally got the take, it was more a matter yeah, of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take cool. that. Yeah. <laughs> It took some doing, but we got uh, eight tunes that are going to be on this recording. And actually, we recorded another tune with a guest singer live to one mic. Oh wow! That that we did that uh, we we did a, a uh, another handful of tunes with this singer that'll be released as an EP. But one of those is actually us playing all playing live to this one mic and him singing to to it the one mic, and it's it's wow. it sounds gorgeous. It sounds really nice. That'll be released later on. That's awesome. Um, so it was one mic, two weekends. That's the name of the album. Yep, that's <laughs> a, you know that was what what do we call it? Well, this one's easy, you know. Yeah. One mic, two weekends. Yep. Uh, and you were talking about some of Eric's recording equipment. Uh, hey. One thing that I think is really interesting is that uh, this is 
recorded to DSD, which is direct stream digital, uh, which is like a high resolution audio file format. And right. it's going to be released in that format as well. Um, right. Prior to its more, yep. again, I guess, traditional quote unquote release where you can get it on other platforms, you know, other platforms. <laughs> but yeah, can you talk maybe a little bit more about that? Um, that, that and here, that? sure. And here I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like, translate as much of what Eric has told me yeah. <laughs> that I get, I can. So, you know, any, any, you know, audio files or, or real, you know, tech people out there who, who get this stuff. Don't, don't laugh at me, but yeah. uh, he, he, so his, it's his studio. And, and because he, he gets a really nice recorded sound. Mm -hmm. um, he's, it's the one, I, I forget the model, but it's an, I think an R88 stereo ribbon mic. Yep. Um, that he positions on one stand in, in, in a diff, you know, we have to adjust where it goes in the room and find, and then mark it. The front end of it from the mic and the, and the actual, uh, interface into the board, uh, from the board and the mics into the, uh, uh, the digital end of it. It's, um, it's pretty involved. So you get a high quality, you know, really nice high quality sound and the sound on the one mic recording when you hear it, especially in high resolution. Um, but even on my, you know, stereo here, it really does sound like you're in the in standing in the middle of the band. Okay. So it's going to be released uh, at first on uh, Native DSD, which is a site which uh, releases these DSD recordings. Um, most of them are like classical recordings. There's some um, there's some remastered and remixed uh, old older jazz recordings that they've done with this process. Yeah. Um, uh no country or anything like that no roots music on there we're kind of like the only you know we're the only oh, thing wow. in that category but we're on there because of the way it was recorded yeah and um uh you know there's some other things like some astro piazzolla tango recordings that kind of stuff um so it's going to be released through native dsd which is like an audio file type type site okay. on uh, april april 16th and then it will release it in regular formats on Bandcamp and all the other uh, platforms for people to, to be able to download. And then there's a uh, there's also I think he inc he's included um, that's going to be on the Bandcamp thing. You'll be able to download the uh, a booklet which will have all the charts for the tunes. Oh, so okay. it'll be like we just scanned all the rough handwritten charts with everybody's notes on them for oh, each wow, tune. That's right. Because um, I should mention, too, that uh, six of the eight tunes are by Gino Rosati. Mm -hmm. And then there's one tune that was written by Eric called The Hope Street Shuffle. Yeah. yeah. And um, the, the last tune on the album is written by a good friend of ours, a great, great composer, guitarist, an old buddy of mine named Steve DeConti, who lives down in Charlestown, Rhode Island. And yep. it's a tune I, I played with him in a quartet back in like 30 years ago in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I always I love this tune. It's called Time for You. Uh, and I, I, I've always loved it. And I asked him if we could try playing it on a gig. And he yeah. was, yeah, sure, fine. Use my tune. And we liked it. We played it a lot. We decided to put it on, on the album. And we came up with a good take of it and um, sent Steve the recording. And he loves it. And, you know, cool. he's happy that the music's being played. So, you know, we have people sometimes writing tunes for us or at least letting us use their material yeah yeah around here yeah no i mean i think it's a really great record um you know getting to take a quick listen to it uh you know prior to our, our interview tonight um yeah there's a good variety of sounds it definitely still like what you're saying has your own touch on it but um yeah moving through some different feelings some kind of like slower melancholy ish stuff to um yeah the, the hope street shuffle stood out to me that was uh one of my favorites as i was listening to this and yeah it's like um, a slinky kind of blues yeah sh shuffle sort of thing and uh um the, as i said the it, the opening track is gino's gospel tune called the yeah. good fight yeah which uh but even the the pedal steel had a different like it was it, to me it was seemed like it was played in an unconventional way like it almost had more of like a keyboard sounds well, he, um then like or it used in a keyboard sound application i should say rather than like well what he yeah what he does in so, on some of those things and especially on like the good fight mm -hmm. um chris well first of all chris brooks is 
he knows he, he he's really familiar with the vocabulary, the country pedal steel vocabulary and and mm-hmm. what role that instrument plays. But he listens and he's informed by a whole bunch of other kinds of music besides that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, he, he can play jazz standards on the guitar. He plays a little saxophone. Um, oh, wow. OK. So, uh, you know, doing music outside of that realm is not, you know, unusual to him. Although he, even though every once in a while I say, hey, let's try this Dave Holland tune in 5-4. And, it, you know, he'll give me the hairy eyeball, but then <laughs> then he'll jump in and, and he'll be playing it. You know, uh, yeah, uh, there's one tune we're rehearsing with it with another writer where it's got a short melody and then everyone plays one by one improvised free improvised sections with the drummer. So instead of somebody soloing over the rest of the band, it's it's one person at a time playing along with the drummer, but it's like completely open and free. And. Yeah. Chris can Chris sounds great doing that too. Yeah, yeah. And and you're right he does on the good fight he uses uh, an effect that's like a, a, a it gives the effect of like a, a Leslie speaker that you'd play an organ through. Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah. that's that's where it has that kind of, and he, and the way he comps he plays chords in that almost sound like an organ or at least suggests that idea. Yeah. I think it's I think it's great and yeah just something that it's, it spans a lot of different uh a lot of different things over this album and um yep. it's As i mentioned um earlier sl- uh, slip and slide gino's tune yeah like I, I it really t- uh, to me especially now that we've got the bass part simplified um <laughs> it sounds like um it sounds like it could be like an older meters tune it sounds like it could be you know something from that catalog yeah there's another tune of his uh that he brought in that's actually we have a video up on eric's youtube site of us recording this one track for the one mic session. Yeah. And Eric, you know, illustrated in little arrows about where the amps are located and where the mic is located. But that tune is Gino's tune called snake oil. Yeah. And, um, he basically at the bottom of the page, when he gave us the tune, it just says little feet. Oh, okay. And he, yeah, he wanted us to evoke little feet on that. So, you know, yeah. So, okay. So I'm thinking like Eric and I immediately, immediately thinking like, What's that groove to Dixie Chicken? So we 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 kind of like adapted that groove and you know you know made it made it work for the tune, and uh, totally different than something like there's a ballad of Geno's that's on there mm-hmm. called "For Those We Lost," yeah, which is yeah. a really sad melancholy melody, yeah, uh, and it's it's absolutely gorgeous. It's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. And there are sections of the tune where now that's one where he knew exactly how we wanted it to sound. We we'll play four bars of the melody, and then he wants us to hold until cue. So oh. the way the song is written, it's like you know he conducts it, and it's like we hold that one chord, then he cues us in for the next one. We play four more bars and hold that one. So it really stretches it out, and it's a very mournful kind of uh, melody, but it's it's absolutely gorgeous. And that one has a whole different kind of a vibe to it. When you hear the two guitars dancing 
mm-hmm. along with each other and and playing around with each other and what they do in response to what's going on and each other. That to me is really where the heart of the band sound is, is like there's these two guitarists who are really versatile and, and both have really broad backgrounds, mm-hmm. but are both very expressive and they listen. That's the other thing is everybody in the band listens hard. Mm-hmm. You know, no one's, no one's at, this is not a chops band. This is not about that. Although everybody has them. Yeah. It's not about, it's not about that. It's about the ensemble sound. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just, you know, some guys that can jam together and then, you know, yeah. one up each other. Um, it's there's yeah. a lot of great connection between all of you. And yeah, the sound is great. I mean, Eric's drums sound awesome. Yeah. But I think, you know, the big question is how many bases did he use on this recording? <laughs> I would have to review, but I think it was like <laughs> about five or six different um, yeah. instruments that I used. I use a variety of like fretted and fretless basses. Uh, yeah. There's a couple of uh, of tunes where um, I try not to do a whole lot of bass solos in on this band mm-hmm. because a lot of times you just don't need them. Yeah. We don't want to make the tunes really long. And I only try to do the, the you know, I'll only play a solo where it, the tune seems to call for it. And a lot of times it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and like that, in, to in me, Montana that's the sky, right. There was a little bit of like the second track on the album. There. Yeah. I'll play a, sh- I, I got a short one there. I've do, I, I, I like playing on the ballads, Gino's ballads. Uh, yeah. uh, the one I mentioned earlier for those we lost. Um, I love playing on that song. And I could play a whole chorus, but the form is so long, it would just make it way too long. So I just took one little section and then that's all. That's all we need to hear from the bass. That's, you know, but I like to change the texture up for some, it, you know, for snake oil, it needed chunky and, uh, and thumpy and, uh, you know, like an old school fender sound, uh, with a mute, with a foam mute on it, um, for time for you, the Steve DeConti song, that one. I got a little space and I had played that song so much in the past. I wanted, you know, I brought along the six string fretless and just kind of mm-hmm. went nuts a little bit on that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, other tunes like um, Living on the Moon that Gene, Gino has yep. has written on there. No bass solo needed on that at all. I just, uh, you know, yeah, hope same, yeah. uh, same with a lot of them. Uh, just not all of them need it. Some of a lot of them just need uh, me to get underneath and 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 uh, and be the foundation. Yeah, and it's uh, in there. Yeah. refreshing to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I know you have a couple of shows coming up as well. Do you want to yeah. talk about those and uh, let people know? Yeah, things are starting to uh, cautiously open up again. Mm-hmm. Um, we actually had the um, the CD release party for guest stars scheduled for March twenty first last year. And guess what happened? <laughs> Was there something uh, that happened last year, Joe? Yeah, <laughs> something came up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had to do a wedding, so I couldn't make the gig. No, um, no. Uh, a year's yeah, interruption had bad timing. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, so you know, we put that out there and we try to promote it, and people have heard it. But um, you know, that was kind of like our, our just you know our dipping our toe in the water. This this one was going to be the first release. Uh, we've got. Um, we're playing at the pump house now. Uh, we that, actually, the pump house was the first place we ever played. Oh, cool. A few years ago. Um, and I've got to give a shout out to them and the parlor in Par- in Providence for being a couple of places that um, allowed us to play. The parlor was having us on a regular, once a month on a regular basis. Yep. And, um, you know, giving us that opportunity. So we're playing at the pump house on the 23rd of, uh, cool. of April. And, uh, It'll be that's, us. That's an in-person show, right? Like, yeah, that's an actual in-person show. They'll have it's an out. They'll have tents now. They do. It's an outdoor show, but it'll be under tents yep. that they have at the pump house, as they were doing back in the fall. But I think it's even probably even more protected than it was back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they st- they we're some of the first people they approached, and that was really nice of them to you know offer some dates. The guest there will be Tish Adams, who's um, uh, a local jazz singer and radio personality, and a old friend of mine i've worked with tish on and off for 40 years yeah yeah. so she was she's been recording a bunch of tunes with us we've actually almost have like a whole album worth of tunes that tish has recorded with us oh wow and as a guest we'll be putting some of those out in the in the coming months but she'll she'll be the guest we'll do a set with tish featuring the material we recorded and some of her other jazz things 
and then Evening Sky will also do a set and we'll feature the recording. The following mm -hmm. night on the 24th, um, we're going to be doing another live stream from the parlor. Okay. They're doing a series of live streams on Saturday night. We did one back in the fall. Uh, we're going to do another one. And these are fundraising efforts This for the parlor. So uh, really encourage people to tune in that um, and, and help support the parlor is, you know, a place that is presenting live music of all sorts and giving mm -hmm. people a shot. So it'd be good to see them be able to come back. Yeah. And then in uh, May on the 14th, we'll be doing another show at, at uh, the pump house. And uh, this time we'll be doing a set and uh, the Tom Thomas white trio. Tom's a great piano player and writer. We've cool. played with him before at the pump house. His band will be playing as well. That's awesome. Yeah, well, I'm excited for you. I'm excited to hear that you're uh, getting to get back out there and play, and, and you know, yeah. um, and this well, album um, is, is fantastic. So, and thanks. We've got some other things coming up. We actually have another a whole other album of original material that we recorded to multi-track. Yeah, and that will be called, that's going to be called "The Desert at Night." Okay. After one of one of the tunes that Gino wrote. Um, that's going to be coming out in uh, prob probably, uh, you know, uh, June, somewhere around there. Oh, really? Okay. And in addition, we've also got a bunch of other tunes that we've been recording with guest singers. So another cut with Michelle Hill, who uh, sang a couple of tunes on, on the Guest Stars album, has yeah. recorded another thing, a couple of things with us. These are, these cool. are covers. Yeah. And then, uh, as cool. I mentioned, Tish Adams is, is, has done a handful of tunes. We might have a few more that we're going to release with her on it. Another good friend of ours, a great singer who splits his time between, he's a Rhode Islander, but he also is a snowbird in Florida, okay. Leland Brown. <laughs> yeah. Leland Brown's a great singer, I, 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 and he came up last summer when he was visiting and came in and uh, recorded about a half dozen tunes with us, and um, he's just a sweet singer, I, I, a great man, real sweetheart of a guy, and a great singer. I, I tell him he has a voice that sounds like honey and hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> and uh he recorded um it, it's funny tish it, tish is known for straight ahead jazz and duke ellington and that kind of stuff oh, okay. we did I a gotcha. police we recorded a police tune with tish we recorded a bill withers tune with tish wow um uh, and and a couple of other jazz things as well with leland we recorded uh a couple of jazz tunes we recorded a thelonious monk tune that someone put lyrics to um we recorded a tune by the band yep and uh, and then wow. he recorded a sting tune as well. So uh, there's a bunch of and a Hank Williams tune. <laughs> we recorded "I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry" with Leland, and it's 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 gorgeous. That's cool. And, when and is then that we're working on a to be out or is that, uh, that those will be released? It won't those won't necessarily be albums. They may be EPs or, or a couple you. of tunes okay. at a time because it's going to be digital downloads. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll release things kind of maybe as singles or in or in small groups. Just okay. to have content coming out and keep people interested, um, because we're you know, like like everybody else, we're realizing people don't consume music exactly the same way as they did, you know, uh, like us old people. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. we don't even consume music that way hardly anymore. So uh, it, we're gonna we can record as we go along. We'll release things as we go along, and they have them mixed and mastered. And of course, on the covers, you have to uh, you know pay the rights to use the, you know, the mechanic. So we'll do that. Uh, we're also recording with um, uh, a few other instrumental guests. We got some recordings that we're going to be doing with um, a saxophonist composer, songwriter named Ben Shaw. Oh yeah. And uh, some interesting stuff with him. Know, ben. We're going to be awesome. Yeah. We're going to be doing a few tunes, a, a bunch of his tunes and some, uh, some other stuff with Ben. Uh, we've got a handful of tunes. We are recording with us and Ben and a trumpet player that Gino wrote an old Navy wow. buddy of Gino's Carl yep. Gerhardt who plays with room full of blues. Cool. And um, so we're recording a handful of stuff with, with Carl, Carl and Ben together. So it'll be like us with the Memphis horns, which is cool. <laughs> yeah. definitely. And then uh, we've been planning some things to record with uh, other, other guests upcoming, uh, the other singers, instrumentalists. Um, and we just, we actually have a sing another single that we're, preparing we released a digital single of us playing um just doing a straight ahead cover version of um walking after midnight the patsy klein tune yeah we just played it as a straight country shuffle and had two guitars player you know chris playing the melody yeah so we released that as a digital single 
we're working on another digital single now that's a uh, a remix re- recasting of uh, Bob Dylan's Highway 61. Oh, all right. And um, it's completely rearranged. Uh, uh, it was inspired by a, a version of the tune that was done by Dave Alvin, the great songwriter. Mm-hmm. And um, instead of having someone sing the tune as like a, a fast shuffle, we slowed it way down. And uh, we have five different characters singing each one, one singing each verse. Oh. And they're not singing. It's all spoken word. Oh, wow. That's cool. It's, 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 it's unusual. And when I ran the idea by the guys, everybody just kind of like raised their eyebrow, but uh, it worked. <laughs> nice. We have um, the, the, the people who did each individual verse include a voiceover artist, a local storyteller, a local rock and roll hero, an R&B singer, and a, an actor playwright. Wow, it's uh, it's 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 going to be cool. We're we're in the middle of uh, of finishing up the mix uh, now, but yeah. that'll be another digital single. So we'll have these singles coming out and um, yeah. you know, different things like that. Yeah. Uh, the the possibilities just you know are, are pretty wide open because now we have a you know a lot of our friends saying, hey, I'd like to do some stuff with you, or mm-hmm. what if we try this. Or someone else will say, "Hey, we should get someone in to sing a few tunes with us." Yeah, um, you know, a uh, couple of other people that we've, you know, we've been talking about collaborating with. Um, a great accordionist from uh, from Cumberland, Corey Pesaturo. Oh, of course, yeah, world oh, class awesome. accordionist and a great jazzer as well, a smoking yeah. jazz player. We're talking about doing some recording stuff and stuff with him. Uh, we're going to try and record a bunch more with our friend Ralph Rosen, who plays great cho- chromatic harmonica and blues mm-hmm. harmonica. Uh, we're talking with, um, you know, d- recording some tunes with a good friend of mine, uh, a voice teacher, actress, pianist, musician, actress named Eden Castile, who um, has a bunch of uh, has has acted in, in local theater. And, uh, you know, she, she's she moved here from Ohio a number of years ago. It's a great voice, too. So yeah. we're, we're talking about her doing some tunes, some more with Tish. Um Wow. And yeah, whoever else we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's we have we have the space, we have the time and uh, we've got a method down now yeah. of recording and and uh, and how to use the studio. And um, uh, whether it's the one mic live thing or multi track with some overdubs later on yeah. uh, and getting creative with how to use the studio. We've had the, the last year. That's been the one good thing that for us that's come out of the last year, other than the fact that we're all lucky enough to be alive. And, uh, you know, yeah. you can't discount that. Um, just being lucky to be to have this place to experiment and develop the band's sound and try out different ideas. Yeah. Well, with everything that you have, I mean, coming out in a couple of weeks to a couple of months or down the road, like what's yeah. the best way for people to – Stay up to date with all that stuff. Uh, well, we there's a f- website and social media. Yep, the stuff. website, the web, the band's website is eveningskyband.com. Okay. And you'll see information up there. Eric, Eric kind of ma- helps maintain that. Uh, the bands, uh, we can find us on Bandcamp as well. And yeah. the the, uh, the first album, the guest stars album, is there, along with the uh, the single right now, "Walking After Midnight." Mm-hmm. Um, I if if. If people wanted to hear like some early raw recordings that we we had from gigs, I have a, I have a SoundCloud page under my name where I put up some uh, audio from tracks from early gigs. Okay. Um, us doing uh, some of the originals, but also some covers. There's uh, uh, I know people can find Gino Rosati. Gene Gene on YouTube. He's Gene Rosati, but um, okay. he has a page where he has a couple of of live performance videos of us from the parlor like doing walking on the moon or yep. uh, other things like that. John Schofield material. Um, Eric Hastings page on YouTube has um, the, the, uh, the one mic video of us recording um, snake oil. And I think he's getting ready to put up another tune from the album as well. Oh, nice. From the new cool. album. He, he got some video of that. He just hung his GoPro up in the corner and, uh, you know, <laughs> watched us. Uh, yeah. Watched us try to get through a tune. <laughs> <laughs> and the look the look on everyone's face at the end when we actually get the good take we all we all spontaneously just did this freeze frame like we did hoping it? that yeah. nothing squeaked or creaked <laughs> and, and and then gradually you see everybody's yeah. face going you know yeah re- resolving into a smile yeah um, yeah 
Well, Joe, I uh, just can't thank you enough. Joe. Thanks for the opportunity, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your support. Yeah, definitely.